to discuss the respiratory system, we actually have to start at the very beginning of the respiratory system, not in the thorax or dealing with the lungs, but with the head and the neck. So the very first part of our, our system where we're going to start bringing air in is going to be the nares or nostrils. Now, this is a model. They're not hollow here, but if you look at your own face, you'll notice there's a nice little hole on each side there, and that leads into the vestibule, this early part of the nasal cavity. It's kind of known for having hair follicles as well as the you know, skin, just as we have on the outside. And then we transition to go into the nasal cavity. Now in the nasal cavity, we have multiple structures here that are called conchae or turbinates. And we'll zoom in a little bit there to see those. There is an inferior turbinate or concha, a middle concha, and a superior concha. Now those are going to make turbulence in the air that we breathe in help to warm it up and humidify it a bit and there are spaces under and between these conchae and that is actually going to be a place where some of the spaces in our head like our air sinuses will empty so here we have our inferior meatus that's the space that is going to be inferior to the inferior concha there that's where our lacrimal apparatus the tears are going to drain then between the inferior and middle conch, we have our middle meatus. That's going to be where our frontal sinus, our maxillary sinus, and maybe a few of our ethmoid air cells that are in the ethmoid bone up here will drain. Between the superior conch, which is much smaller, and the middle conch, we have the superior meatus. More ethmoid air cells will drain there. And then here we have what's called the sphenoethmoid recess, and that's where this airspace our sphenoid, sphenoid sinus in the body of the sphenoid bone is going to drain. Now one thing we can't see, because we're right on the midline here, is the nasal septum. That actually separates our nasal cavity into a right and a left side, so that's something we can't see right there. But if we take a look at this skull, you can notice that we have our vomer and ethmoid bone making up the nasal septum that divides the cavity into two. We can make out our inferior and middle conchae in there as well, even though they're not covered by mucosa. And then we're going to transition from the nasal cavity to this area called the nasopharynx. Now the nasopharynx is where our middle ear is going to open up and we have the auditory tube connecting the middle ear to our nasopharynx. Now one thing that's a little bit difficult to visualize about that is that the two nasal cavities enter a single nasopharynx. So right here, looking from the posterior inferior side, we can see the nasal septum right here, and the two nasal cavities on either side emptying into the nasopharynx. This space that we're passing through, not a structure, but the space, is called the koana. So I'm sorry we have a conche up there and a koana back here, but that is the name of this opening, the right koana and the left koana, which connect the nasal cavity to the nasal pharynx. So as air is inhaled through the nostril, it's going to pass through the vestibule, the nasal cavity, through the koana, into the nasal pharynx, just here. I want you to note that separating the nasal cavity from the oral cavity is the hard, bony palate, and then the soft palate here, made up of muscle. As we pass from the nasal pharynx down, we're going to pass into the pharynx just posterior to the oral cavity. And not surprisingly, this is called the oropharynx. We'll talk more about it and the oral cavity when we talk about the GI tract. From there, both food, water, fluid, and air are going to pass into the laryngopharynx. And the laryngopharynx is here before we get the esophagus for food and beverages and the larynx for air. So we have this common area, hence the propensity of uh, humans to choke or inhale substances into their lungs that were meant to go down their esophagus. But this is going to show where our opening of the larynx is. Now one last thing to note is that we have multiple air cavities emptying into the nasal cavity and nasopharynx. We've mentioned these already, but We've got the frontal sinus and maxillary sinus. We can't see it here on the model, but it would actually be just deep to here within the bone. And those are both going to empty into the middle meatus. The lacrimal apparatus, carrying tears from our eye, actually empties into the inferior meatus.
And then here our sphenoid sinus is going to empty into our sphenoethmoid recess. We have some other air cells in the ethmoid bone. They'll go into multiple openings in this area. And one thing I want to note before we go any further is that here in the top part of the nasal cavity, both on the septum, which would be that plate covering the midline, as well as the lateral wall that we're looking at here, we have what's called an olfactory epithelium. And this is where the first cranial nerve, cranial nerve one, is going to send its nerves that are going to be able to sense smell. So our entire sense of smell is localized in this area. So as substances come in with the air, our olfactory nerve is able to sense and smell what's going on in our environment before that air passes down through the nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, and then finally into the larynx itself, which is going to take it to the lungs. Last thing, when we think of the middle ear, we always think about hearing, and that's where we're going to talk the most about it, but we have an auditory tube here in the nasopharynx opening that actually connects to the inner in the temporal bone and that also connects with air cells inside our mastoid process. So if we take a look here we can actually see the temporal bone and mastoid process of it very posterior but believe it or not inside this is a space that connects to the middle ear which then connects all the way back to the nasal pharynx in the posterior part of the airway. So that's the end of what we've got to talk about here. We're going to now take a look at the larynx in much more detail. The first part of the larynx is going to be the opening of it from the laryngopharynx here. This is called the vestibule. And there are several cartilages that hold the larynx open and allow it to, to do its work. It's a little tough to see on this model, so we're going to move it out of the way and focus instead on this one just here where we can see the exterior of the larynx along with some muscles and the thyroid gland. We're not going to talk about those right now. But one thing to note is the hyoid bone in the neck is anchored to the larynx through this thyrohyoid membrane. And so it's called thyrohyoid because this uppermost cartilage is called the thyroid cartilage and it's got this large anterior shield-shaped appearance but it's actually kind of uh, discontinuous posteriorly, so it does not make a complete ring. Now as opposed to that, we have our cricoid cartilage here, which is narrow anteriorly, bigger posteriorly, but does make a complete ring. Sitting atop the cricoid cartilage is this little guy, the retinoid cartilages. There's one on the left and a separate one on the right. There's a little cartilage up here called the uh, corniculate, we won't worry about it right now, but the retinoids, the cricoid, and the thyroid are going to be very important in adjusting the tension on the vocal cords so that we can speak clearly but also opening them so that we can breathe quicker and allow more air to get into our airway as needed. Now the rest of the structures that we can see here are a little bit tough to spot. Again, the opening here with our epiglottis just anterior to it. This is the vestibule but to see the rest of it we're going to need to look a little bit further down and you can see the gap just a little bit pale there, but you can see the gap between the two vocal folds. That is called the rima glottidis, and it's the narrowest area because it's the part that closes when we need to whisper and opens wide when we need to breathe quickly or yell. So now, let's take this apart and take a look at each side. Oh, let's see if we can get that out of there. Okay. So once again, we had the laryngopharynx here, the vestibule here, We've got our epiglottic cartilage right here, thyroid cartilage, and then cricoid cartilage, small in front, big posteriorly. And here we can see two different folds. The most inferior of the two is the actual vocal fold, or true vocal fold, and that's got the vocal cord at its core, and as it moves, tenses, relaxes, abducts, adducts, all done by the muscles of the larynx, that's going to change the tone and volume of our voice. The fold above it, superior to it, is called the false vocal fold, and that is going to be immobile. It doesn't really move that much, and between the two is a space called the ventricle. Now I know there's a space called the ventricles in the heart on the right and left side. This is also called the ventricle. I did not name it that, so please don't name, don't blame me for that. But that's going to be the structures of the larynx, after which we get into our trachea, made up of C-shaped rings of cartilage, heading on down to the lungs. 
Now, if you've ever heard the terms upper and lower airway, there's actually a bit of disagreement on that. Some people put all of the larynx in the upper airway, others exclude it from the upper airway, and some people say that the upper airway ends right when we hit, like this one more time, right when we get to the point of the true vocal fold.